Well, this morning, we're going to talk about some strongholds, and one of the strongholds we're going to talk about is worry. And uh, I have never, never, never in all my life, I, I've been doing this since 1978 in the Lord. And I got to tell you, I've never seen, you talk about a pandemic out there, or what they, what they call a pandemic. There is a pandemic of worry in the body of Christ. And, and, and I do understand it, and I don't fault. I don't judge, but I can't condone it. Because it is against everything that Jesus, Jesus himself said, don't worry about tomorrow. He said, don't, don't worry about this. And Paul writes, don't grow weary in doing good. Uh, uh, forget what lies behind and press on. Be anxious for nothing. We can just go all day long and talk about the effects of worry. And yet it has very, uh, it's not just crept up. It's been like flung, as my dad used to use that term all the time. It's like been flung on us. And I mean, it's there. We wake up to it. We go to sleep with it. You can't turn on the news. You can't turn social media. Oh my gosh. I, it, it's like, I, I don't know where to begin on social media. Uh, everybody takes shots at people and people taking shots at other people and everybody has an opinion. And, and I, I get it. I do get it. So this morning, uh, I hope to leave something here for uh, we, when we take out the trash, we'll take that out with us. Amen? All right, so let's get going this morning. First thing I want to talk about in strongholds is just a couple of things before we get into recognize the cost of worry. And by the way, it is a major cost. Uh, first of all, what, what are strongholds? Uh, something that has obviously a stronghold on us. Now, I'm going to tell you some strongholds are pretty good. Uh, we should have a stronghold in the mind of Christ. That should be a stronghold on me and you is the mind of Christ. Uh, peace should be a stronghold in our life. But the kind of strongholds that Scripture talks about is the strongholds that, that cause fear and worry and stress and woe and cause us to habitually say and do things that we have to go back and go, oh, my gosh, why did I do that? And uh, uh, one of the things that where strongholds come from, and, and we'll put a slide up in just a second, but the Lord was sharing this morning, I had a dream about when Jesus, uh, in the Laodicea church, the last day church, Laos people, Diocese rule. We've got to keep understanding that term because we clearly see people ruling right now. Do, are you seeing it? And we're seeing that there are those that, 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 that will permit certain things to happen uh, socially like uh, uh, riots and whatever, but you can't have church. We're starting to see something interesting that happened when Christ was crucified and we're starting to see the political spirit and the religious spirit come together to shut Christ down. We're seeing it right before our very eyes. And I will tell you for, as your pastor, on the one hand, I am excited about it because we're about to see something that many of us have dreamed about. It's happening before our very eyes and we're gonna be right smack dab in the middle of it in a good way. But when we start looking at these things and we start, we start worrying, we start fearing, these strongholds come about us. And Jesus was outside of the Laodicean church, and you hear him doing. And they don't even open the door. They holler out through the door. Can you imagine Jesus knocking on her heart, and we don't even open the door to him? We holler out at him, and we go, hey, what do you want? He said, if you'll open the door... I'll come in and I will dine with you. I will relate with you. I will be intimate. I will fellowship with you. But you got to open the door. And then why? They're not, they're up and they're not opening the door. And then so what did he say? He said, let me, let me just give you a suggestion behind closed doors. Can you imagine? And he said, I suggest that you get for me the white robes, the linen, the righteousness of saints, as, as purified by fire. I suggest you get the gold purified by fire. I, I suggest you get from me what you need because you say you are rich and have need of nothing, but you are naked, blind, and poor. Isn't that something? That's the condition of where the enemy tries to get this day church together. But that's not us. How can we shut the door to Jesus? In fact, he is the door. How can we close Jesus when he is the door? How can we shut the door that he is the door? So there's a lot of people right now that, that, that the enemy wants to. And so let me just say this. 
the absence of light or any darkness that we permit in our soul, in our thinking, the mind, will, and emotions, any absence of light will cause strongholds. Any area that we don't yield to the light of God, and, and we'll, we'll see some scriptures of this in just a moment. But one of the things I love about scripture says that the, that the entrance of thy word brings what? Light. Light dispels darkness. That's why it is important for you and I to renew our minds, not on Facebook, not on Twitter, not on all the rest of the stuff, TikTok, TikTok, not on those things. Quit, let's quit renewing our mind on the news channel. Let's quit renewing our mind by listening to negative conversations and renew our mind daily, be transformed by that renewing of mind by the word of God. And don't find scriptures to justify or judge another group of people or another person. Don't find scriptures to paint them wrong. You're right. Find scripture because it is the voice of our father and he's talking to us as if he just wrote it right now. See, if he's the same yesterday, day, and tomorrow, here's what's cool about this, beloved. In the world, you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, John 16, 33. Okay, we know it was written some 2,000 and something years ago, but according to the word, he just spoke it. It's fresh. We got to quit thinking this is old stuff we've read and it pertains to everybody else. No, this is like the father speaking to us right now. If we just got to, you remember when Jesus was confronted in the wilderness and he came back with, it is written, it is written. And to me, the most amazing thing that many, many conservatives shut down is he said, it is said. That's the rhema word. Guys, we, got a need, we need to have a rhema word today. We got to quit listening to these voices and listen to the one voice that is after our well-being. And that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to tell you, worry and stress and all these things will shut us down. Another definition of stronghold is a thought pattern, alien, say alien. You can put, you can put that slide up, Dave. Thought pattern, uh, thought pattern, alien to the word of God. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I listened to one pastor talk one time and he said that stronghold is a house made of thoughts. And I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty good. House made of thoughts. Because so as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Uh, see, our fight with the Lord is over the moment that we gave our heart to him, what little of it we knew that we had. But whatever we gave to him, our fight, we are no longer at enmity with God. What does enmity mean? We're not duking it out with God. God's not our enemy. We're not, we're not, we're not going after God, he, and God's not going after us. But the fight with the devil is still ongoing. It never has stopped. And we think, well, if I just... Uh, you remember as a kid, guys, uh, you, you, you got taught about the boogeyman? And you remember what our weapon against the boogeyman was? Just pull the covers over your head. Like that's going to stop an axe murderer. I mean, come on. We get, we get taught these childhood remedies for things that are very, very fear. And we realize that we get older, it doesn't work. Paul says that when I was a child, I used to do childish things. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Childish and children are two different entities, two different words. Unless we're like little children, we can't inherit the kingdom. But if we're childish... We can't come near the kingdom of God. And I think right now we're seeing so many childish things happening. Uh, the battle or control is in the thought life. And a new life requires a disciplined mind. In fact, would you put up Philippians 2.5 for me right now? And consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before. Let his mindset become your motivation. Now, I'm going to tell you, God expects us to have a complete shift in our thinking. In fact, scripture tells us the moment we're to get saved, several things happen. Not only do we have eternal life, it's not something that we get, we have it now. Not do we, then we become fully adopted into the kingdom of the family. We're not, we're adopted as an adult with full rights. An adoptive son or daughter in Texas has the exact same rights as a born son or daughter in the state of Texas. There's no differentiation between the two. The moment we said yes, he said, we have been adopted into his family and we can call him Abba, Father, right? So what's interesting about this, God expects this shift, this shift of thinking. He expects us 
So the first thing that happens after salvation, when God goes after our soul, mind, will, and emotions, is that we're to have the attitude that which is in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? Because I'm telling you, thoughts and attitudes and, and actions are all tied into the same thing. Now, the last thing that the devil wants, according to this scripture, is a renewed mind because it produces a changed life. The moment our mind is renewed, it changes our life. It will change us. Our family will go, what the heck's happened to you? Which it, I, we all speak personally to that. Even Jesus' own family thought to put him, the guy away. I, I, I keep going back. I read it again the other night. Actually, it was by accident. And I'm thinking, well, there's no reading the Bible by accident when you, you, you find something. But you remember when Jesus was in, basically, he was in the pub, the beer joint. And he's in there with all the sinners. And his mother, half-brothers and half-sisters and mother came after him. Obviously, Joseph had passed away by then. And they came and said, Jesus, you need to come with us. And Jesus go, who is my mother and brothers and sisters? And you remember what the next line was? They tried to put him away. They thought he was crazy. That he didn't even recognize his own mother, brother, and sisters. And they were missing the point because he's basically going, these are my brothers. These are my sisters. These are now my mothers and my fathers. He was identifying with the people in that pub. He was identifying with sinners. That's what made Jesus so unique. And that's why we shouldn't worry because he identified. Another good example. Daniel. You go back and look at. You remember what was going on in, in all that time. And all of a sudden, if you go back and read Daniel 9 and 10. We all, in, in, especially the charismatic realm. We all get all hooped up over the spiritual warfare going on with the Prince of Persia and Michael and all that whooping going on. That's awesome. It's a great read. But we ought to read beforehand when God says, I have something to say to you, but you need to get out of this place because I'm about to tee off on everybody here. And what did Daniel do? He said, Lord, he said, I consider myself one of them. But he said, but you've not fallen to their gods. He said, but these are my people that you gave me to. He identified with those folks. And so God says, okay, I'll reveal a dream. I'll withhold this judgment from you, but you've got to do something. That's why Jesus came. I, Jesus came to identify with me and you. And that's why he didn't come to identify with worry and stress and anxiety. Those things, those things are, you don't think Jesus, what do you think he felt in the garden? Think he knows how we feel when we're stressed? Oh, my gosh. So, the second thing that I want to say besides it's, it's, a, it's a place where the enemy's thoughts actually become more credible than our own. See, he is a power of suggestion. He says things. By the way, he can't get our thought life. I, I, had, I had, had a guy say, well, pastor, it's like the devil knows my thought. That is not true. No one knows the thought in the heart of man except the spirit, according to the word of God. Unless we communicate it, guess what? So don't you hate it when someone says, well, I know what you're thinking. You don't know what I'm thinking. I don't even know what I'm thinking, according to scripture. But God does. The Holy Spirit does. Jesus does. But we need to have this understanding that, that in this thinking process, um, the power of suggestion is, and then all of a sudden we go, hmm. And then we can't, we start repeating it enough, and then we don't know that it's our voice, the devil's voice, God's voice, or other people's voices. But sometimes we let Satan have a more credible voice because we actually think it is our self speaking. That's why I teach you all the time quit being negative on yourself. Negative self-talk talk is absolutely hellish. Jesus never will do that to us. The Holy Spirit would never do that to us. We're the only ones that want to call ourselves names. We can go back and look at scripture after scripture of men and women trying to do that and trying to, whether they manipulate God or motivate God to whatever, get him to move on their behalf, and it doesn't work. I, uh, let's look at Ephesians 4.29. Or 427. There we go. 
Don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. Now, that's a pretty good word. So that does show that we can let the devil come into our thinking and start speaking his words. Bible says, Paul writes, don't you need to know the schemes, the schemata, the plans of the devil. Um, how many built model airplanes and cars? I know you ladies did that all the time. How, how many of y'all did that as a kid? Oh my gosh. Of course, I didn't know at the time. That's why they put level, you know, they put warnings on testers glue. I stayed wired 90% of my, my kid life. You know, hair, I'd come to the table, I've been building airplanes for like nine hours like. My dad go, what's wrong? what's wrong with you? And I'm going. <laughs> After a while, here's what happens. I start building these planes. I love to build planes. Oh, I'm telling you, man, it's awesome. And I build these planes, and then all of a sudden, I start thinking, I can take shortcuts. And then I start, because I know this doesn't, this is covered up. No one ever knows. And next thing you know, you got like 900 parts stuck to the little plastic things that should be in that model, but you didn't put it in there. The devil is counting on you and I not having a renewed mind that that's exactly what we do with scripture. That we will, okay, John 3, 16, been there, done that. I've said it, God's love. I get it, I get it, I get it. I'm just gonna leave that piece stuck on the little thing here. And then all of a sudden, but it looks good. And Paul writes, it's like a form of godliness. It looks good, but what's stuck is what the devil is going. He's taking inventory. Man, he left three wheels, a crankshaft, and, and, and two windows stuck on it. Guess where I'm coming in? Don't give the devil an opportunity, beloved. We say, well, pastor, it's easier said than done. No, it isn't. It's actually very easy to say, Satan, get behind me. Submit to God, resist the devil, and what, he'll stay up and have dinner? He'll take a ride with you? No, he'll haul butt. Can I say butt? Is that okay? He'll haul glutus maximus. He will knock down every fence getting out of your yard between here and hell to get back to where he came from. It starts with submission to God. And then you say, I'm not putting up with this stuff anymore. Enough is enough. Lord of the Rings, by the way, the news, I love your, that thing on the Lord of the Rings. I'm telling you, I'm rolling. I, I, I was just, you got to see on Facebook what they put. One of my favorite parts, my, my number two movie, The Two Towers, is probably my favorite out of all of them. When Gandalf stands up there and that Balrock thing is coming up and he goes, you shall not pass. We need, a, we need more men and women like, that's not fable. We need more men and women in the church that will say, sickness, you will not pass. COVID, you will not pass. Diabetes, you will not pass. These things that are going on, mental illness, you shall not pass. Guys, who else on the face of the earth has been given that authority but you and I? They didn't give it to a turtle. God didn't give it to, to a mule even though he's used mules on many occasions because the church wouldn't work. The point I'm trying to make is he gave it to you and I and says, you, I've been giving you the keys of the kingdom. Now, you know what? If you have a key, you have authority. So use that authority in my name and, and come together where two or more are gathered in that name. Use my name. And anything that you ask according to my name, what? You will get it. Well, I don't have this because you're not asking. He says, we have not, James, we have not because we what? Ask not. Well, pastor, you ask for me. I can ask for you all day long. Don't mean you're going to get it. In fact, I might get what you're asking for because I'm the one asking. You ever thought about that? So y'all keep on. That's good. All right. Oh, that was free. Anyway. Let me tell you how strongholds uh, are derived from three sources. You ready for this? Strongholds are derived from three sources. And here's the first one. A stronghold comes from our experiences. Say experience. Experience, experience behind us. That's why Paul says, forgetting what lies behind. Don't use those experiences of your past to validate the word of God in your life right now today. 
Don't use those experiences to have victory day. Listen, Joshua, Joshua got whooped today. You know, this could be a great play on words there. I won't go there. He got whooped because he used the same tactics that he did at Jericho and some other victories that he had. And he naturally thought, you know what? I've whooped this bear. I whooped this lion. Who is this Philistine dog? And he goes after these guys and it cost him his best men. They died foolishly. And, and Joshua comes back and goes, oh God, what, what did you do? He said, you didn't inquire me. You didn't ask me. Guys, come on. There is power in our thinking, power in our voice, power in our thoughts. Once he asked God, he took care of A. He took care of it. All right. So Joshua used the past to think he can justify the future, and it didn't work. Let yesterday go. Just don't touch it. It's got cooties. When we had our loss, and by the way, Heather, my heart breaks for you guys with, with, with the, the, I'll tell you, we had a loss of for 16 years and Carol and I not having kids. Wow. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, it was our hairy kid that we had. And I remember one day we're walking him and someone had thrown bubble gum on the ground. Now it's not good to watch a dog chew bubble gum, but what had happened? You remember this, Carol? He had ants all over the bubble gum. And he just instinctively, without thinking, and he, oh, what? Food, um, eat. And you should have seen him trying to spit bubble gum with ants on it out of his mouth. I felt so sorry for him. Once he ate it, I'm telling you, it wasn't coming out as fast as he went, it went in. And I just got to tell you guys, it's like our past. We got to be careful about picking up and eating all that stuff again because it's loaded with all kinds of critters. Lysol won't take care of our past. You with me? You can get all the disinfectant you want. It's not going to handle our past. The only thing that handled our past was Jesus ate it up at the cross. So, so not only is it behind us, and, and listen, I'm going to say this. It's what never happened in our past is the issue that brings bondage. It's how we relate to it today is what brings bondage. Someone said or did something to me. Okay, well, whatever. Well, okay, if I don't bring it back up and I don't jack with it, then it's not, it has no power over me. I'll tell you guys, ooh, ooh. Second thing is a stronghold may be rooted in the environment around us. And that's what we're going to talk about here in the next few moments. Look around. Tell me how many strongholds are being developed right now. We can't do this. We can't do that. We had a conversation again already this morning. Listen, I don't even know why I'm bothering to show up. I'm over 65. I have what they call pre-existing medical conditions. You folks should have already killed me. I don't, I, I don't know why I bother to get up and go eat, go potty or anything. I don't know. I, why? I'm going to die. Everything, everybody tell me, I turn on TV, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You walk here, you're going to die. I'm going, really? And I have Jesus' voice going, uh, would you let me back in because I've given you life and life more abundant? You know what I'm saying? Life more abundant. But they're saying I'm going to die. Who cares? Whose report are you going to believe? You're going to believe me or your lie? You know, you can be the lying eyes. Or you can be this. Listen, all I'm hearing about is people recovering and getting back to normal. Well, actually, I hope they never get back to normal. I hope we become one of the most abnormal group of people on the face of the earth. We're already lunatics for Jesus. We're already aliens. We might as well act like it. You know, you get saved and people say, well, you'll, you'll tone down as you get older. Don't you let anybody steal your thunder and worship and tell you you can't have zeal. In fact, it was zeal that cost Jesus his life. Zeal is for, it was his zeal for you and I and for the lost that cost him his life. All right, here we go. You ready? So what is normal and acceptable right now may be in direct conflict with the word of God. You seeing that? Absolutely. So why would we want to be worrying about and freaking out over these these mindset and develop a mindset, develop a stronghold over all this stuff that's going to, I, I, 
I, I can't go out. I get it. I'm not knocking anybody. I understand. Prudence is amazing. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't fault any of us. I'm telling you, I, I, I struggle. I really do. The mass thing, doing it. I, I get it, but I took like this spiritual Hippocratic oath. I'm to lay hands on the sick and they recover. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to hide? Do you want me to sequester? Do you want me to? Qu- I get it, but people are sick and people are dying. They need the gospel. What if we all hid? I, I, I understand. I'm not again. Hear my heart. I'm not blaming and putting fault and trying to shame you in anything. That's between you. That's why I said beginning. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Whatever the Holy, He guides us into all truth. If that's your truth, hey. I'm going to celebrate you. But don't tell me I can't go lay hands on the sick. Don't tell me that I have to back up and and let the enemy override us. That's not a very good pastor for you. And if we go down swinging, we're going to take a whole bunch with us. You make sense? So I'm just saying, but don't think for a second that we're just walking like nothing. Come on, we're human. That's why you pray for us, that we make decisions based on what the Word says and what the Holy Spirit says and not what we think we ought to do. So, uh, apart from Christ's beliefs, we can become entrenched in our minds real quick with all kinds of stuff that's happening around us. And the last stronghold may be derived from a system of error within us. Say error. Now, see, false information produces false thinking. And so as a man or woman thinks within himself, so they are. Do you see how this thing is working with the devil? False system, a system of error drive. And I want to tell you, when we come to Jesus, God's word, the truth, begins to deliver us from these things. He begins to deliver us from these things. But we've got to be in a position to walk in that truth said it before, I'll say it again. Now listen, it is not truth that sets us free. We're paraphrasing the scripture. It is the knowledge of truth that sets us free. It's the knowing, it's the epignosko. That's the Greek word, epignosko. And it means to know intimately. It's not that I know of, I've heard some story I, I throw you out, I, I cast you out, demon, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. He knew about Jesus, but Paul knew Jesus. And Paul's out there laughing. I, I can only imagine what was going through Paul's mind watching this thing as they get whooped and run out of there bleeding and naked and whatever. And Paul goes in there and takes care of it. Beloved, we who know Jesus need to act like we know Jesus and to know him experientially and to, to, to know by experience, to know him intimately and, and knock down any door that's on our heart, on our mind, on our eyes, our ears that would shut in his presence to where we're the ones that think we should let Jesus in when we want to. Um, I've had friends that were wonderful in the Lord and then they fell miserably. And I'm just gonna tell you, there is no, no little fail. Failure is failure. The devil is gonna, we talked about this. Failure is not fatal, nor is it our identity. But the enemy wants to make it so. But this guy told me, I went to pick him up one time from a situation that was going on. And he used to wear all these Christian t-shirts and he wasn't wearing one, he was wearing a secular t-shirt. He said, man, I just felt bad doing a crime wearing a Christian t-shirt. And I'm going, dude, do you think wearing a Christian T-shirt is going to guard your heart and mind? I mean, it, it, come on. It's, what, it's, it's inside of us. Nothing going into a man is what defiles. It's what proceeds out. From the heart, the mouth speaks. The heart is desperately wicked. So what do you think Jesus targets? The devil wants to target the mind, 
But Jesus goes after the heart. He wants because from our heart. So the entrance of that word brings light. When the, the heart is filled with God's word, then our voice will be filled with God's word. And then faith come by hearing God's word. And next thing you know, you hear yourself actually speaking God's word. So you're reading the Bible to yourself. Read it out loud. Act like your heart. Someone said, you have a, you have a ministry to the deaf. And I go, every Sunday. Read it out loud. <laughs> well, that's a little embarrassing. To whom? You want to see all kinds of pucker that the devil does? Just start reading the word out loud. That guy's going to fold, spindle, and mutilate right before your very eyes because he can't hear. If faith come by the hearing, he ain't going to have anything to do with faith. So if he starts hearing, if the devil starts hearing the word of God, you think he's going to stand there and listen? He will haul Botox. He goes. Read the word, and you need to hear the word written in, here. In, you know. By the way, you say enough negative things. We say enough negative. Why don't we start saying God's word about us? Why do you think every Sunday we go, we are who God says that we are. We can have what God says we can have, and we can do what God says we can do. Guys, that is so childish, elementary stuff. Robert, you, you guys, got Katie and I, you know what they do, whatever you permit them to do. And as they get more mature, you give them a little bit in there to where they don't have to ask you to do everything. Some things ought to be by habit, whatever. That's the same thing with God. Until we start gaining our maturity, I'm telling you, God has provided everything we need for life and godliness. And we should stay right there in that realm until he moves us into a different place. Amen. All right, stronghold is free. Y'all ready to get to worry? Oh, baby. I love it when a plan comes together. All right, I got about 1,900 messages on here. Okay. Uh, let me tell you two things that we should never worry about. You ready? Two things that we should never, you can go ahead and leave that up there, but two things that we should never worry about. You know what they are? Take a, take a jab. Two things. This is very interactive this morning, two things. And you at home, I wish I could have a monitor, show me a sign. What do you have? Two things that we should never worry about. What do you think? Anything and everything. What? Anything and everything. Anything and everything. Well, that's good. That's close. I could use that. What else? Not all at once. It's very overwhelming up here. <laughs> it's, it's causing my mind to... Let me give you the first one. Things we can do something about. We should never worry about things we can do something about. Oh my gosh, I got a flat tire. Huh. You got a spare? You got teenagers? That's why, you got to understand, that's why God made teenagers. Come on. <laughs> I am stranded out here. Get off the tent. Come get me. So the first thing is things we can do something about. And here's the next one. Things we can't do anything about. That's the two things we should never worry about. Things that we can do about and do something about and things that we don't do, can't do anything about. What difference is it going to make? Well, oh, my God, I can't. I can't. Okay, you can't. But Scripture says... I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So you got to chunk can't. It, it, change it. That's a different excuse. It, well, I just can't do that. Well, that's not true. It's I won't do it. That's a better answer. I won't do it. Can you and will you? Uh, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Well, this is, this is so much fun. I love you guys. <laughs> you know, worry is a costly habit. And it's been well said, guys. Well said. Now, here's it. Worry is also harmful to a person. You know what that means? Worry wears out the mind and the body. In fact, the Mayo Clinic, I, I thought when I first heard that back in the day, I thought that's where they made mayonnaise. I ain't kidding. Mayo Clinic. I, I'm telling you. I'm thinking that's where that came from. The Mayo Clinic claims as of two years ago, 
that 80 to 85% of their caseload is illness due to mental stress. And they say that worry is the fuel line for that stress. Worry is the fuel. It's the fuel line. It's the, it's the conductor. Uh, the Scots, uh, their fuel pump, I don't know if it's a fuel pump or a filter or whatever, something like that. They, they couldn't get any fuel into their engine, no matter how the ignition started. You could hear it igniting and, and we're pumping and we're doing this. And, but if you can do it all day long, but if, if the fuel isn't getting to the engine, it doesn't matter. And guys, I'm gonna tell you, if worry is shutting our fuel line out, it's clogging our fuel filter of joy. By the way, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We'll let worry plug it up. It's that simple. Uh, consider this. We can worry ourselves to death, but we can't worry ourselves to life. You see how the devil designed that? Hey, let me think. I think I'll do some. Oh, I can worry them to death, but if they ever figure out they can't worry to life, I'm in trouble. Oh, okay. So what happens when we begin to worry? You ready for this? Now, you remember last week I brought it said all kinds of physiological problems. Someone said, well, what is that? I love it when you ask me questions. So I'm going to tell you right now. Anybody know what a hypothalamus is? You know where it is? Point to where it is. Tammy, look at Carol and point. And Carol, you point where you had it. Both of y'all would be correct if y'all were together. <laughs> where is it? Someone tell me. Come on. It's this little tiny thing about the size of a lima bean stuck right up inside of all here. And I'm going to tell you what, you better be kind to your hypothalamus. You want to lose weight? If you train and teach your hypothalamus that Coca-Cola and Pepsi is bad, guess what? When you drink a Coke or Pepsi, it won't taste good and it won't do anything for you. If you believe water is good, then water is what is received by your hypothalamus. It directs everything. It sends that information out. It's pretty interesting. All right, so the hypothalamus in the brain sounds an alarm. All of a sudden, you start worrying. All of a sudden, the hypothalamus is alerted because it's familiar. Say familiar. familiar. See, again, again, guys, you know my love for onions. My hypothalamus, I smell an onion. Alarm, alarm, bells and whistles going off. I'm sitting next to Fiddler the other night. He had red onions on his salad. And I'm going, good Lord, Fiddler, get saved. You know? Yeah, I saw you loading a bunch of them on the corner of your plate, though. Yeah, I understand. So you're partially saved. So anyway. But the point is, the hypothalamus sounds a lot. You get worried, but here's what happens. That's not a good thing. That's a bad thing because the alarm is going to cause the rest of everything to start working wrong. Listen to this. The motor area of the brain sends a message to our muscles, causing them to tense up. Everybody say rigor. Rigor mortis. We get tight. We get chest gets tight. Throat gets tight. Oh, we, you know, we, we start cramping. In fact, what it does, it causes the muscles to fill with lactic acid. What's lactic acid? Man, I'm going to tell you, that's not good. In fact, you know why you have a cool down? You, you know, Christina, you can tell me you have a cool down when you work out. Why? The muscle is stored with lactic acid. If you just abruptly quit, you'll Charlie horse and it cramps and it causes problems. So you have to have a cool down to kind of draw off that lactic acid. Well, here we go. So the motor area acts like uh, the brain sends a message, muscle causing up. Our nervous system now kicks in and bolsters our muscles for readiness and our heart begins to beat faster. You ever notice that? Oh, I'm telling you, physiological change is happening. The tiny blood vessels in our stomach shut off uh, the blood supply to our digestive system. That's why we start getting sick to our stomach, start getting crampy feeling when we start worrying. Oh my gosh, it gets worse. Our breathing becomes quicker and shallower. It's COVID. <gasps> you ever notice that? I mean, come on guys. This is what the devil sits back and laughs at us all the time when we're feeling this way because he has produced worry in our life. Listen, he may not be 
the cause of our worry, but he's behind our worry every step of the way. He's fueling it on. He's egging it on. He'll make sure that that becomes a strong hold in your life. By the way, you know what, you know what scripture says that, that God did with kings that had strongholds on his people? You remember what he did? He cut their fingers and thumbs off. Toes and thumbs. I dare you. Hey, what a struggle. Grab a sword with no thumb. Grab a weapon with no thumb. That's what God did for us at salvation. He's whacking toes and thumbs off. And on top of that, he's shattering their teeth. So they, they, they can't thumb us, thumb us, they can't gum us, and they can't toe us. The stomach muscles, oh, now here we go. The stomach muscles and the intestines may go into spasms causing the nauseating feeling. You ever had an intestine go into a spasm and it twist? Lift your hand if that ever happened to you. I'm going to tell you, do not wish that on anybody. We're on a flight. We're, we're, we're going into Dnieper Petros. Actually, we're going to Kiev on this Russian airliner. And I, oh, dear Jesus. I have never prayed so hard in my entire life to touch ground legally. They gave us this hamburger. You remember that, Carol? And it was green. It was green. I'm not exaggerating. It was green. The patty was green. They said it was seasoning. I'm saying it was green. And if I can't pronounce it, I ain't eating it. So it's got this long a word for burger written in Russian. All of a sudden, I turned wrong and my intent nodded. It is like, oh, you're getting a Charlie horse in your gut. I'm telling you, it was miserable. I'm over there trying to do an exorcism on whatever, that burger. Finally, it got all right. But I'm going to tell you, that's what the devil was. He likes to get our stomach in knots. But here is probably the next, my three favorite. Blood pressure increases and red blood cells are pumped into the spleen. Uh-oh, that ain't good. Because I'm going to tell you what the spleen is about to pull. Our sweat glands open up and saliva drives up. You ever had cotton mouth? Boy, you got that feeling? Sugar pours into our system from the liver. See, listen, this worry is causing all kinds of stuff going off. And to top it off, this is my favorite. The adrenaline gland releases adrenaline into the blood to maintain all of those problems. So once it starts... You're in for a bumpy ride. Oh, beloved, is it worth worrying about something that we can't do anything about or even if we can do something about it, is it worth worrying? When Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, you, you realize that we steal from God when we worry about tomorrow? He said, don't worry about tomorrow. If I go worry about tomorrow, I'm stealing from God. That's God's to worry. God, let God handle tomorrow. We have today, let today, let those new mercies. God didn't give us two new worries every morning. What did he give us? Two mercies. If, if that, I got a feeling there's probably more, we probably can't handle any more than two. So what are some complications to worry? We die young. That's complications. Well, he died of complications course COVID I mean everybody's listen there was a guy who was killing a car wreck and they listed a COVID death worry is contagious and it can affect our family our friends church each other so recognize the cure for worry you ready for this oh come on recognize the cure for worry in fact let's put up uh, Matthew 10 29 30. You can buy two sparrows for only a copper coin, yet not one sparrow falls from its nest without the knowledge of, wait, 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 wait. Did we just read something interesting? A sparrow, a bird, an aggravating little bird that likes to fly over my car. 
And yet, if he falls out of the nest, Jesus knows about it. But you don't know, Lord, what I'm going through. You think? He don't know? When he knows if a sparrow falls out of... Look, look what it says. Without the knowledge of your father, aren't you worth more to God than, than many sparrows? So don't worry. What? 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 He said, think about it. He said, don't worry. For your father cares deeply about even the smallest detail of your life. If you openly and publicly acknowledge me, I will freely and openly acknowledge you before my heavenly father. Oh, my gosh. Lord, you have no idea what I'm worried about today. Really? He knows the hairs. He, 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 he knows the hairs on our head. Well, God, you're, you don't care. You're, you're, you know, you know one, golly, I call that poor me crap syndrome in Scripture. And we have a lot of it going on right now in this country. PMC, PMC. I might make a T-shirt, make money for the church. <laughs> Beloved, here's the truth to live by. God can pay attention to every sparrow and every one of us at the same time. In fact, I'll call it this. He is our dad, right? He is our father. He is Abba. He's our D-A-D. He is not our D-A-D-D. That is called divine attention deficit disorder. He is not deficient in his understanding of us. The second thing is our focus. We have to focus on the Father. We understand his word. Now let's focus on Jesus. Uh, you remember when, when Peter, James, and John went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They are up there with God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit was there. And Moses and Elijah was there. I'm, I'm, listen, man, they were having a soiree up there. And you remember it says they were looking up, and the next thing you knew, they looked down. And when they looked back up again, what does Scripture say? They saw no one but Jesus himself alone. Beloved, I will venture to say probably one of the most important scriptures for our walk on this earth is that one right there. In everything we should say and do, we should see nothing and hear nothing but Jesus himself alone. And then all this junk that's happening around here becomes oblivious. It just doesn't have any effect on me. So let's look at Philippians 4, 4 through 9. This is great scripture. Be cheerful. With joyous celebration in every season of life. That, that's, that's the bad stuff. As well as good. Let joy overflow for you were what? United with the anointed one. Let gentleness, ooh, gentleness be seen in every relationship for our Lord is ever near. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Are we hearing this, beloved? But I'm going to worry this afternoon. Then it is disobedience to the word of God. Do you remember when they told, keep, keep it up there. Do you remember when Jesus told the boys, he's a fisher of men, but he wasn't a fisher of fish. And he told those fishermen, drop your nets on the right side of the boat. Peter gets out there. Oh, Peter, Peter, Peter. I'm telling you, what a guy. He gets out there, gets a boy, and he says, you know what, who's, who's this guy? They didn't even recognize him. Who's this guy to tell me where to drop? So I'm going to drop a net on this side of the boat, and what happened? He caught so many fish that he couldn't haul it in. The net broke, and he lost the entire catch. So he's coming in pouting, PMC, and Jesus said, go back out and do what I told you to do. So they go back out. They threw their nets, plural, on the right side of the boat, they caught so many fish that they had to call for it. Scripture says every boat that was on the Sea of Galilee came to help in the harvest and the haul of that fish, and everybody came. Let me tell you right now, beloved, we can go through life doing some of the word, partial word, and we're going to have nets that break. But the moment we dare to do what Jesus said to do, not only is it going to be a blessing to us, but it's going to bless everyone around us. I want to be so blessable that I am a blessing. I don't need a blessing all the time. I want to be that blessing. Does that make sense? Oh, gosh, folks. A person who is worrying is a person whose mind is out of focus. 
When our mind is focused on God's word, prayer, and praise, peace results. I just love listening to our worship. I don't care what's on my mind. Carol can tell you, listen, we, we, we catch it. We come in, and when we hear this, we are transported immediately. Transported. I'm in a different place. I can breathe better. I can sit back, and this peace envelops us. I love it. I love it. Hey, there may be a chord off. There may be a voice. I, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this spirit of worship and spirit and truth comes off and it just does something. Uh, in fact, let me show you this. Put up Psalms 119, 165. There is such a great peace and well-being that comes to the lovers of your word and they will never be offended. Wow. Let's look at John 14, 17. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another Savior. Wow. The Holy Spirit of truth. Who will be to you a what? A friend just like me. And he will never have you. Look at this. The word won't receive him because they can't, they can't see him or know him. But you have seen him, you have known him, and he intimately, because he remains with you and will be beside you. The Holy Spirit will never leave us, beloved. Never leave us. Never, never, never. If he goes, we go. It's that simple. All right. Uh, let's put up Romans 8, 38 and 39. I'm going to close with this. Here's our future. That's why we shouldn't be worried about tomorrow. I love this. So I love this. So now we live with confidence that there is nothing in this universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I am convinced that, that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, the Nephilim, or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present future circumstance that can weaken his love. Wow, isn't that something? Keep going. There is no power above or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which he is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Wow. So what's able to separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing. Except... See, you want to limit an unlimited God? Just start worrying about tomorrow. Start disobeying the word of God and see what happens. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous. See, we're getting two right there. He is faithful and righteous to do what? Forgive and cleanse. He goes one, he does extremely above and beyond, which we hope for, ask for, or, or even think. He wants to cleanse the sin. That means it's no more fun to play with. It's clean. It can't be dirty anymore. We like sin's dirty. We like playing dirty things. But he now cleans it up and is like, oh God, this doesn't even feel this doesn't even feel right anymore. Does that make sense? Listen, tomorrow did not belong to God, uh, to, to us. It belongs to God. Let me give you three things as I close what's going to happen when we drag worry into our present. The first thing is it buries blessings, it steals our strength, and it produces problems. It's that simple. That's it. Now, How many are worrying? Slip your hand up. How many are worrying? It's okay. Are you saying that nobody in this church is worrying right now? I see, I see one hand. Who else? Two. Come on. Oh, come on. Don't be lying to me now. God start naming names. Let me tell you something. It is a human condition to worry. It is a 
mindset, a stronghold to worry. We have been taught that all of our life. And now we're in Christ and we think that goes away. So I have a suggestion to everyone. I'm gonna tell you something. I have been worrying. I have been stressing. I've been worrying for you. I've been worrying for this church. I've been worrying about its finances. And God reminds me every day, why are you worrying? And I don't have an acceptable answer in him, but I have plenty in me to come back at him with. Well, thou no Lord. Don't say that to Jesus, by the way. When he asks a question, don't say that. So here's what I'm saying. Why don't you do something? Let's all touch our minds right now. Holy Spirit of peace, peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, we yield our thoughts. We yield our attitude. We yield our heart, our mind, will, and emotions. We yield, uh, we yield our body to you, which is now an instrument of righteousness it is acceptable before your sight because of Jesus. We yield all that we are, all that we were created to be, all that we think we've tried to create ourselves, and certainly all that the enemy thinks that we are, we yield to you right now, Jesus. For we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and worry, anxiety, stress, sickness, all these things are not of the mind of Christ. And we ask now, Father, for a daily, daily renewing that with each day until this is done, that we will no longer have a stronghold in our life of worry, no longer a stronghold of fear, no longer a stronghold of depression, but a stronghold of Jesus in our life. We ask you, Father, to hold on us. Hold on to us, Father. And we thank you that even now that, Father, even tonight when the enemy comes, tries to get us stressed, we will lift up a banner against him and we will declare to him that we are who you say that we are and we can do what you say we can do and have what you say what we can have. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.